This is a Digital Music Trends 142 recorded on the 24th of July 2013. This week on the show, the White House and private initiatives against piracy, Amy Mann vs. Medianet, Pandora and potential new bills, copyright review in the US, Gigit and more. Hello everyone and welcome to Digital Music Trends, uh, the weekly show where we try and make sense of the latest news in the digital music industry. And Digital Music Trends is available on a variety of channels including iTunes, most podcatchers, SoundCloud, YouTube, Mixcloud and more. And you can email feedback to contact at digitalmusictrends.com. And this week I'm really happy to introduce uh, three great guests on the show, starting with Cristalia Garcia, a visiting professor of law at the George Washington University. So hi Cristalia and thanks for joining us. How's it going? Hi, I'm very well. Thanks. Thanks for having me. It's great to have you. And uh, also on the show, great to have uh, Zach Greenberg, uh, senior editor at Forbes, where he covers the business of music and entertainment. So hey, Zach, and great to have you on. How's it going? All right. Thank you very much. Thanks for joining us. And uh, it's also great to have back on the show Zach Carter, uh, or Zachary, I guess, because uh, we have two Zachs today. It's going to be <laughs> hard to uh, uh, point you out. A senior political economy reporter out of the Huffington Post. So how's it going? Just fine. Thanks for having me back. It's great. So let's delve right into it. As Cristelli is only about twenty minutes with us, and uh, this week uh, we're going to start. Uh, we're going to to stay stateside for the majority of the show. It's actually quite a slow news week, which is uh, good because usually we have to go through a hundred things in uh, just under an hour. And uh, we're going to kick off by discussing the latest announcement by the White House Intellectual Property Enforcement Coordinator Victoria Spinell. Uh, this was made uh, last week in a blog post where she announced a new initiative uh, that sees the likes of Google, Yahoo, Microsoft, and AOL come together to come but piracy, primarily by reducing the financial incentives to piracy itself. So essentially, this means that uh, you know they're going to um, cut off sites that contain primarily pirated content uh, from the likes of Google AdWords, for example, and thus reducing the uh, profitability of the sites and the incentive to exist, essentially. So the White House has held private initiatives as an important part of the agenda for fighting piracy. And uh, Victoria Spinell also sp- spoke at the World uh, Creators Summit uh, last month in, in, in DC, where, where I was. And she addressed uh, those points uh, particularly. So this seems to echo uh, her feelings on, on the importance of private initiatives. Uh, and uh, how how do you feel about this uh, uh, new development? Do you feel like it's a victory for uh, the music industry? And will it have any effects? Uh, uh, Cristela, do you want to start? Um, sure, uh, I'm happy to start. I um, I think it's interesting and and it's absolutely reflective of a trend that we're seeing a um, both a push from the government side and a push from the corporate side to have more um, private uh, solutions to these problems. In part, perhaps because uh, governmental and regulatory solutions haven't proven that effective. Um, but also, I I think perhaps because there is a greater chance of effectiveness for a lot of the private solutions and uh, from in the account. Uh, a lot of uh, law and economic types have been looking for some time at um, emerging phenomenon. A lot of what my team looks at, for example, uh, seeing private deals improve efficiency where, for example, the statutory license for yeah. performance rights, for example, doesn't do as good a job. We see companies like Clear Channel and Big Machine negotiating their own private deals to a more effective result. Um, we've seen Sony ATV, for example, one of the largest, uh, the nation's largest publishers, withdraw its content from ASCAP and begin negotiating private deals. And they're, they're advertising, you know, more effective results. Um, so I think the idea is that, well, if we can get more effective results through private ordering in in these ways, maybe we'll get more effective results when we private order um, vis-a-vis uh, infringement as well. I think there's a lot of reasons to believe that that, that, that is true um, if it's effective. That doesn't mean that there's not concerns resulting from this, of course. It's, it's, there's nothing that will necessarily be a foolproof result. And yeah. at least on the, on the business side, we've seen that private ordering is great and efficient for the parties involved, but it's not necessarily efficient for the parties who are not involved, the smaller guys you know, who can't get a piece of the action and it will be interesting to see how that plays out in the infringement context yeah yeah sure and zach on the entertainment front uh, how do you feel like the labels are going to perceive this move and do you think they feel like this is a victory of something they've been advocating for a long time now uh yeah i mean i I think so for sure i I think i think cristelli really you know basically said it all but um you know i think uh there have been a lot of efforts um you know like this over the years to try to you know make sure that uh, musicians and record companies get paid for music they put up. Um, and I think that, you know, this is another step, um, you know, in the right direction. I mean, uh, how much uh, of an effect it'll have immediately on artists' bottom lines, you know, 
I think remains to be seen. I think especially yeah. when it comes to um, you know things like uh, streaming and, and you know um, you know that that sort of thing. It, we're still kind of in in the infancy here uh, in terms of you know artists actually getting compensated and adoption is. Yeah. You know, relatively low compared to still terrestrial radio. So you know, artists aren't um, you know kind of quite reaping the rewards uh, that you know perhaps they'd hoped yet, as as we've seen in the news this week um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> from Tom York and so forth. But you know, I think it's really important to set up this framework um, in advance. So you know, in potentially a few years down the road, and you know, however long when when streaming does become. Um, as you know, as I think it will, the dominant uh, way people will listen, and um, you know that uh, that people will be um, you know only only consuming more and more music online. Um, you know that that uh, that these uh, structures are set up correctly and um, in a way that will fairly compensate artists. So I think Absolutely. it's definitely a step. Yeah, and, and, and Zach, on a, on, a, on a more general note, in light of the PRISM revelations uh, uh, of the past month, uh, of course, one uh, has to wonder whether it's a good time to talk about a joint initiative between the government and the biggest internet providers in the, in the world, and uh, uh, whether also the fact that it was announced fairly quietly in a blog post uh, is a, 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 a resonance of, of, of this feeling that the public doesn't really want to hear too much about uh, government-led uh, uh, initiatives with such big providers. So do you feel like that's a fair comment to make? Uh, I, think, I think to some extent that's a fair comment, but I also think, you know, Victoria Espinel's job, she's the intellectual property coordinator at the, at the White House, I mean, her job in large part is, is just to, to sort of ameliorate concerns from within the industry that the administration can't really do anything about from a, from a more concrete policy perspective. Uh, most of these groups, I mean, she, she basically ends up doing stuff on, on trade policy or, or, or other types of symbolic actions that basically benefit big record labels, uh, big movie studios, or pharmaceutical companies, um, but don't actually end up creating any sort of concrete policy change. And I, I think this is kind of something that... That, that is stemming out of the failure of SOPA a couple of years ago. You know, most of these companies were all pushing really hard for the Stop Online Piracy Act, and that fell apart in large part because, you know, politically at least, uh, it, it really ran afoul of the tech industry. And so here, here you have, you know, a lot of tech companies, Google, et cetera, working with, uh, with, with these, these record labels to, to try and make things look pretty good and, and look like everybody's getting along. But I, I think in reality, the, the, the ways that the music industry wants, to, the music industry here being the record labels, want to deal with, with piracy fundamentally are, are at odds with the ways that, that most tech companies want to handle, handle their, their own businesses. So yeah. I think you'll, you'll see some difference at the margins here, but I don't think this is going to make a huge difference in, uh, you know, in, in, in the way music is distributed and the way it's, it's trafficked. Um, yeah. And I also think it's really interesting, though, that you know, as the way we talk about this, too, is that, that the, streaming, the streaming companies have sort of become the like, anti-artist whipping boy lately. As these, these record labels that you know, 10, 15 years ago were, were getting pilloried for having you know, poor poor standards for, uh, you know, for, for artist payment are now sort of seen as like, oh, well, these guys are kind of good. If, if we want artists to get paid, we've got to pay the record labels first. And I think yeah. from a, a public relations perspective, that's an interesting change. Um, either of you guys had uh, anything to add to that? Uh, well, I would just say that, yeah, that I agree. I think he, he's, he's really hit the nail on the head. I, I found it very interesting to see the, um, you know, having, having worked in record labels for a large portion of my professional career, I find it um, fascinating uh, to sort of pass the buck, if you will, to, yes, indeed, you know, look at how the streaming companies are ripping off artists when, um, you know, that blame was just very recently placed upon record labels, and I guess to some extent still is. Um, yeah. And, uh I, I think the the more interesting question um, that sort of stems from you know initiatives like this is you know well what what is the alternative you know it, 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 do do we really think that if we don't have streaming services that this will improve music sales or will it be as the streaming services would argue well they're either going to pay you pennies on the dollar or they're going to steal and and those are the only two options and yeah. I think that initiatives like this are at least trying to explore their options even if they are in fact simply a band aid to sort of you know appease labels who didn't get SOPA yeah. in, in the way that they wanted so Interesting. Absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, I just wanted to stay with you for a second because um, there was another story that uh, came out about a month ago, but I haven't really addressed on the show because I never had the right guests to do so. So uh, as far as legislation is concerned, aimed at, uh, aimed at pu punishing users uh, uh, or uh, downloaders of uh, pirated content, I think the US government, uh, we can fairly say that has steered well away from that uh, general uh, direction, especially in the backlash of the RIA, RIA lawsuits. Uh, and uh, seeing how initiatives like Hadopi in France, for example, haven't exactly paid off uh, uh, and, you know, 
uh, we've seen France abandoning that uh, to to um, a large extent uh, um, last month. So in, in February, though, in the US, uh, a six strikes system derived from a collab collaboration between RIAA and M MMPA and five US ISPs uh, started seeing the light as part of uh, the Center for Copyright Information, which was news to me. I never heard about this center. Uh, I think it was founded actually in, in light of this new. Uh, 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 agreement, I guess, and after reports of a few warning emails sent by Comcast, uh, Warner Cable last month announced uh, uh, that they're going to start to implement this gradually. It's going to be a system where they can, uh, you know, uh, educate the public about not downloading illegal material and about the risks of doing so in terms of viruses and all sorts of other stuff that can happen uh, when you go on PTP networks. So, first up, what are your thoughts on the Center for Copyright Information, and what kind of is is it like a completely privately led initiative? Does it have any type of mandate? Um, well, you know, I, I, like you, don't know a lot about the the center. Um, yeah. I, I learned of it in, in you know, surrounding the same information that you did. Oh, yeah. I, I do suspect that it was formed uh, largely largely for that purpose. So I don't know exactly what the mandate would be. I imagine that it also has something of a um, sort of appeasement uh, effect or, or, or goal uh, that it's supposed to be there to... Um, you know, respond to industry concerns and, and attempt to alleviate where it can. The um, I gather this from the fact that the policy which they've passed, um, which is neither here nor there in terms of, you know, whether it's a good thing or a bad thing to have necessarily, but it's clearly something that is in response to demands from from the record labels. Yeah. And, and, you know, I don't have to re-comment on all the commentary that's been out there, that it clearly is at odds with the business goals of the the ISPs who would be having to put it into effect, which is why there's a lot of questions around the efficacy of, of such a system where, you know, every uh, ISP can set its own, you know, sort of punishments, if you will, um, or its own, you know, there, there's no requirement as to what they have to do. And there's really no incentive for them to cut off customers who are paying. Yeah. So that is it, is it more of a slap on the wrist? Is there a deterrent effect just to the threat for people who get the warning and are scared by it? Or once people realize that it's a warning and nothing else? Is it really not going to accomplish anything? Yeah. Um, the, the bigger the bigger question is sort of what are what are the efficacy of systems like this and if the if the, the if this new copyright center is charged with that I would say they should consider perhaps looking at as you mentioned the failure of these systems in other countries in other regimes such as France and you know maybe it's time we consider something more of a reward system um, we we've seen that the stick isn't always effective maybe a carrot would be more effective and there yeah. are some proposals out there that would actually argue for you know uh, a subsidized system wherein people who don't uh, get caught, you know, get certain perks, they get faster connections, nice. or they get yeah. whatever. So, Absolutely. you know, I think that there's some there's some uh, action out there to um, say that if we are going to have a center whose mandate is to do these sorts of things, maybe it can be done more effectively. Yeah, absolutely. And, and Zach, you're, you're in New York, uh, where uh, Time Warner has, uh, is, I, I guess, a, a wall for many. Uh, many of you New Yorkers have heard the horror stories about the service over there. And uh, how do you feel people would react to st start getting notifications about their internet usage? Do you feel like uh, after the whole RIAA debacle, uh, people are aware that they're, what they're downloading is being really monitored? And uh, do you think there could be any backlash from them, you know, from operators just showing up to your door and saying, we downloaded this and we've seen exactly what you've done and we know, we know what you're doing online? Yeah, Time Warner would not uh, really be winning any popularity contests. And I, I don't think they are any way around here. No, exactly. um, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you know, I think, again, it's a step in the right direction, um, you know, but I think it's just going to come down to, you know, more broadly in, in the music industry, um, you know, can can uh, products like Spotify, um, and, you know, continue to be delivered? Um, you know, can uh, the music industry continue to, you know, to find ways to produce um products that, that are more appealing than, than going on and illegally downloading something. Um, and, and, you know, I think that's where this war is going to be won. Um, and I think, you know, that's why Spotify, for example, is such an important uh, entity, you know, in, in this battle, because it's, it's like, well, you know, why would you want to go through the trouble of going to, you know, BitTorrent or whatever? Uh, you know, and, and especially something that's not very user friendly for for the less tech savvy uh, people in the world, when you can just go on Spotify and, and hear anything you want um, yeah. for free. For free, essentially, yeah. And Zach, uh, uh, for, for, from your perspective, do you feel like this is something that is just uh, an, an appeasement uh, uh, proposition? The whole 
uh, initiative, the whole CP, CPI or whatever the, the, the acronym is for it. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, is there any other reason for it to exist other than make sure the RIAA and the MPAA are happy? I mean, the, the Center for Copyright Information is an industry front group, essentially. Like, and there, there are a lot of these groups. So instead of having to have it be like, you know, Warner Music or Columbia Records or something, I met a lot of them in Washington last month. <laughs> yeah, right, right. It's a town full of them. You know, there's this, there's this sort of you know, more, more cuddly sort of front group that, that can pursue the, this agenda. But I would say one thing about the Center for Copyright Information that's different from a lot of these other front groups is that their board does include uh, Gigi Sohn, who is the founder of Public Knowledge. Uh, and Gigi is one of the, at least in Washington, one of the most respected people who, who typically takes the side opposite from the record labels on, on copyright issues, yeah. uh, thinking sort of more about how, how copyright intellectual property ought to be structured to, to you know, create a better user experience for people, not just necessarily to create uh, larger profit margins for, for, for copyright rights, rights holders. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I think that, that means that, that this has the, the potential to, to, I think, be a little more interesting than, than most of the traditional industry front groups uh, would be. Um, but, you know, if, if they're coming out of the gate by talking about scaring people away from pirating stuff, I mean, I, I just think in practice this, this hasn't worked. It doesn't work. Uh, uh, if, if you want people to stop pirating things, you really have to offer them a better, more accessible alternative. And I think yeah. programs like Spotify and Pandora are really easy to use, and they are really accessible. Uh, but Gigi would be, I think, the first to, to acknowledge that so far the, the business model and the, the intellectual property framework in which they're required to operate isn't, isn't really ideal yet. Yeah, sure. And Christelle, I just wanted to uh, ask you before you before you have to go uh, about the uh, copyright review. And you were mentioning at the beginning of the show there's going to be some hearings tomorrow uh, from artists that you're going to be uh, going to. So okay, can you tell us a little bit more about what's happening tomorrow and how that fits into the into the copyright review framework? Um, sure. So uh, a while back, I guess in the early spring, um, the Register of Copyrights, Mira Palante, uh, testified and, and mentioned to Congress, um, or she pushed Congress to, um, for a full revamp of the copyright laws. And it's, you know, being uh, widely called, you know, the next great copyright act and yeah. did get uh, Congress interested in actually looking at a full review of the copyright. And this would be the first time we've had anything like this, you know, since the 70s when the, um, the Copyright Act that we're currently operating operating under was passed. And so if yeah. you think about all of the techno technological um, and even just consumer preferential changes that have happened from the 70s to now, and notwithstanding a, um, a little rash of you know amendments uh, like the DMCA that happened in the 90s, even from 95 when that was yeah. going on in 98 with the latest amendments, it's you know a world of difference. So we're far we're way overdue for the for these um, for a reconsideration of these things. Um, it's it's complicated and I think people now recognize that putting something, um, putting an inflexible regime in place that won't allow for, you know, we think streaming technology is all the rage, but, you know, two years, three years, five years from now, who knows what the new technology will be that will be challenging the copyright laws. So the hearings that will take place starting tomorrow morning, um, it's just the beginning of what I assume will be a series of hearings. Uh, one of the artist reps um, from Copyright Alliance will be testifying, among others, to speak about the ways in which, as 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 Congress and and the legislators sit down and begin considering these things, they can hopefully put means in place that will go back to the original protections that we're supposed to be keeping in mind, which is you know to encourage uh, the progress and innovation of the arts, right? So yeah. um, there is a push from from folks like me um, and other like-minded people to really try and make that more of an artist-centric approach, um, which was sort of the original Copyright Act in 1909 was very artist-focused. And in, in the 70s, we went a little bit more towards, you know, copyright holder focused. Yeah. And I think there's a push now to go back to, um, you know, somewhere in the middle, but, you know, swinging back towards the artist end. So, um, as I said, I think that tomorrow will be, it will be interesting to see what the tone is, what some of the questions are that, were, that are asked. And um, maybe it'll give us a sneak peek as to what uh, the, the legislators at least have decided are the important issues. Yeah. And is there a, is there a, a, a place to... Um, keep a track of what's happening on that front uh, on in terms of the hearings or, or transcripts or, or videos or anything like that? Um, I'm not sure if it's going to be live streamed, but you could certainly look it up. It's uh, it's the uh, House Judiciary Committee, right. uh, the subcommittee on intellectual property. They have a website, so you might could look for the for the hearing that's for tomorrow Thursday, uh, 9:30 a.m. And it's um, Goodlatte, G O O D L A T T E. He, it's his hearing, so right. um, you could look and see if it's streamed. If not, they may have um, they, they will almost certainly have transcripts and things like that available afterwards. Um, if you'd like to follow my tweets, I'm 
going to try to live tweet from there. So if anything interesting comes up, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll keep you posted. Great. Awesome. Well, I'll let you go. Uh, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Great to meet you guys. Um, great. Have a good one. Great. So uh, let's uh, carry on by talking about uh, some more slightly lighter weight stuff because we've covered policy a lot now. So I'm just going to move to something completely different. And uh, Zach, you covered a story uh, just yesterday, well, today or yesterday, you published a, a piece on a new uh, gaming software. So this is called uh, uh, Gigit. And uh, it's kind of Farmville meets a rock band, as you described in the article. And uh, of course, I would encourage everybody to go and check out the article itself on uh, Forbes.com. But uh, could you uh, tell us a little bit about uh, what the company does and uh, and how they launched, essentially? Yeah. So the the company is um it's a little, it's a little confusing because in some of the literature it says just gig it, and in in, in other uh, parts it says play gig it. But right. the official name is play gig it, which is a little clunky. <laughs> um, but but I think. Uh, uh, you know, what they're doing is pretty interesting. Um, they've created um, a Facebook game. I mean, and, uh, you know, poured, I think, oh, about $20 million into it. Um, this guy, John Acunto, uh, who's kind of a web 1.0 guy. Um, there's a, a, a VC firm that poured in about $10 million. They've got some uh, private investors on board. Um, they've got 70 artists on board uh, from Two Chains to Lil Wayne to Miguel to Nas. Um, and uh, Kevin Lyles uh, is managing um, a bunch of artists now, former head of Def Jam, uh, yeah. who was actually responsible for their video games, um, Vendetta and the like, in the mid-2000s. Um, you know, so, so they, they put together this, this huge game with, with all you know, this critical mass of supporters. And, and basically, you, you log into Facebook, and uh, and you play. I've, I've never actually played Farmville, but I'm told it's kind of similar. <laughs> you yeah. you, uh, you kind of you, you know you you pick your uh, your team, uh, and instead of you, know, you pick uh, you know a rapper, or a singer, and, and you you plan out a concert, and you you know you have a certain amount of money uh, that you start with, and and you know it costs more for for a big venue, a big artist. Um, uh, you know, you can pick songs, you can buy songs um, to, you know, with real money to play in your virtual world, or you can play that you have in your real collection. Um, and, you know, you, you basically, the, the better concert you put on, the more virtual guests you get, uh, and the more virtual money you earn. Um, of course, you can spend real money to upgrade your your virtual uh, concert uh, status, which I think is, I think is basically the, the farm bill angle. Um, yeah, and then, right. you know, in, in kind of the rock band side of things, you pr progress uh, through your career sort of as a, as a music mogul concert promoter and, and, you know, by planning more and more lucrative tours and, um, and so forth. Uh, but, you know, the, the hook here is that, um, you know, as I mentioned before, all, all the people who, who kind of signed on, um, you know, they, they may be achieving, or at least they hope something of a critical mass, um, you know, such that, uh, you know, th there's enough support, enough artists tweeting about it, um, you know, to kind of get it off the ground. And from the artist perspective, it's, it's kind of a new um, arena for making money because in this virtual world um, it, where they're having their virtual concerts, you know, they, they get paid whenever somebody buys their music through the game system. Yeah. Um, there's a direct link where you can buy their merch through the game system system they can actually if they have a clothing line uh you can specify that they you know that little wayne wear a truck fit shirt uh, and then you can go and order the truck fit shirt through the yeah. game blah, blah, blah. so you know will, will it catch on who knows but um you know they're definitely going to go of it and uh yeah. you know I, i've never been one to to pay um money to buy fake things and in it you know, pay, pay real money to buy fake things in the fake universe, but a lot of people do. And, yeah. you know, if Fontville can be Perfect. as big as it is, I, mean, I interviewed Kevin Lyles about this. He said, you know, who, who really cares about a cow, right? Yeah. It's like, you know, but you can get really passionate about your favorite artist in the way that you can't or I couldn't get about a cow. Yeah. Um, so, you know, maybe they're onto something. Uh, and at, at, the, at the very least, you know, it, I think it's worth it um, – for some of these artists uh, who are getting, you know, decent advances, they wouldn't say exactly what, but some of the artists have actually invested in the company. I think some of them may have accepted equity in the company um, as kind of an advance payment, uh, you know, for getting involved. And it's just another way to sell, you know, image and likeness, sell their music, sell their merch and so forth, um, you know, which I thought was kind of a, an interesting um, 
an interesting kind of avenue to open up. And particularly if they're going directly to the artists for this sort of thing. I mean, one of the big problems that, that artists have, have had with the streaming services is that they have to go through a, a record label intermediary to, to get to do business with Spotify or Pandora. And that oftentimes the big record labels end up eating up all of the economics of that transaction you know, before, before the money actually trickles down to artists. And so if you can have a system, even if it's you know, a fairly unconventional system, it's going to have to be a fairly unconventional system, in fact, uh, it, where, where a, an artist can work directly with a new platform to get paid directly, then I, I think you, you're talking about the types of innovations uh, that we were, we were discussing a little bit earlier. I'm not saying that this one will actually you know, be, be a, a revolutionary breakthrough, but it's a way for artists to make money without having to go through you know, several different middlemen who, who end up making all of the money at the end of the day. Yeah. I mean, I can offer some insight on, on this because I, I actually worked for a game, music gaming company for, for a while that uh, didn't work out. And one of the, I think one of the key issues that I think uh, Zach, you were pointing out about uh, trying to cut out the middleman is that if you're looking at doing a game that includes music, that becomes impossible. Because even if you're doing a direct deal on the artist, on the merchandise, uh, you're still going to have to go and license the tracks of the labels and go and license the tracks of the publisher if you're doing uh, a natural game. Because it becomes like a, a, a licensing situation, which is a track by track rather than blanket. And so th that... that brings in even more middlemen, I guess, rather than mm -hmm. cutting them out, because uh, then you have to do a direct deal with the artist if they don't have a 360 deal for the merchandise side and maybe even give them equity. You also have to pay a ton of money to the record label to license the track and promise them a cut of uh, whatever money is generated from playing that track within your game. And you have to do the same with the publisher. So, I mean, yeah. I, I've, I've been there and it's very complicated. Uh, I, and, you know, I really hope that somebody can crack that then not because I think there's, there's money there, but it's... Uh, it's difficult money to extract, I think. <laughs> yeah, well, and from a user perspective, you know, if, if you're the if you're the, the, the you know the entrepreneur setting up this this new new platform, I mean, no user is going to want to use your your music industry game unless you've got a lot of artists on there, and so you've yeah. got to cut deals with people who can provide you with a lot of artists, which typically tend to be these these big labels. And so, you know, what we've seen with with Pandora and Spotify and the streaming services is that those big labels end up getting the biggest slices of the pie, yeah. uh, and we'll see we'll see if that that you know that plays off as we see new types of of you know disruption media coming about. Yeah, exactly. And also, like, it's a question of seeing whether Facebook is still as relevant as it was maybe two or three years ago, and whether mobile is absolutely necessary now or not. Uh, mm -hmm. Zach, anything? Sorry, uh, I cut you off there. Yeah, no, I mean, I think uh, another interesting thing is that, you know, we talk a lot about um, streaming as the future of the music business, and we talk about the idea of, you know, artists kind of getting their, their music out there and, and maybe not getting um, compensated very well or at all, um, but the idea of, you know, kind of spreading the word and really kind of cleaning up on the road and through merch and, and so forth. Um, but I think I find this particularly interesting because it's it's sort of a way of, of doing that virtually, right? Um, you know, virtual, virtually getting your merch and virtually, uh, you know, doing doing these concerts. I mean, obviously, it's, it's not anywhere near as lucrative as um, actual concerts, but, um, you know, the, the, the kind of virtualization of, of some of these non-music uh, uh, revenue streams, you know, if it, if it ever takes off, could be, could be an interesting source for these guys. Absolutely. I think, I think it could be a big source. It's just a, a case of really finding a way th to navigate all these different rights and managing to establish your business model in a way that uh, it's, it's workable for both the company that is trying to make this business model work and for the people that are trying to get paid from it, which are the artists. So that's, uh, that's really like a, a, tough, a tough nut to crack. And uh, so uh, I, I wanted to go back to sort of more uh, heavyweight policy stuff now. Um, so we took a little bit of a break, but I wanted to talk about Pandora and also ask uh, uh, Zachary about your views on, on the, the copyright review as well. So first of all, um, let's go over uh, the Pandora story. So we haven't really covered it in the last the past couple of weeks because uh, uh, Spotify really has taken over as the uh, the big body of the industry for for for, for a time at least until people <laughs> stop talking about streaming rates and but uh, you know the, the Pandora debate is still very much alive even though no big headlines have happened in the last uh, three weeks and uh, you know uh, Greg Sandoval of, of um, uh, from the Verge had written a great piece about uh, Pandora's PR problem about three weeks ago uh, we haven't really heard much in uh, the way of a, re of a new rehashed uh, 
uh, Internet uh, Radio Fairness Act, uh, which was uh, shut down uh, last year. It didn't even make, make it out of committee. Uh, but uh, when I was in, in DC last month, uh, I could still hear a lot of uh, people buzzing about uh, the fact that this may come back to the floor at some point and it may be re reintroduced in some, in some other way. So do, do you feel that that's something that Pandora is, keen, is still keen on pushing even after all the backlash? And uh, can you see this uh, as something that is going to come up uh, uh, when sessions resume in, in September? I mean, it, it's hard to say whether or not it will actually, you know, get, get a, a serious hearing in, in the House this early, particularly just how crazy politics have been this year. And there's, there's going to be a showdown over the debt ceiling again, it looks like. So there's, there's going to be a lot of other stuff in D.C. that's going to be higher priority for people um, th than this bill. Um, but I, I, if it did have a path to some sort of serious consideration or, or, or potentially passage, I mean, you would have to see it moving beyond the type of debate we had last. I mean, last time it really just looked like Tim Westergren and Pandora trying to cut lower checks to, to artists. And, and that, that, that is not the PR position that Pandora wants to be in at all. It's not going <laughs> to go all. anywhere when that's, when that's what, it, what it looks like. Uh, and, and I think realistically, he's going to need more allies. You know, you, you're not, you're, you're not going to be able to, to do this alone, especially when the people who you're, you're, he has institutional opposition here from the record labels. It's very, it's one thing to have, you know, do-gooder consumers, artists saying, you know, well, this, this will hurt us. But when you have, when you have other corporate entities on Capitol Hill lobbying against you, it's really tough. Um, yeah. That said, Jason Chaffetz, I talked to him a couple months ago at CPAC, even at CPAC, he wanted, which is a big conservative political activism, you know, Thing that happens in, in DC, uh, e even at this, which is you know mostly about you know all kinds of social issues and things that you know musicians are often disinterested in or opposed to. He really wanted to make a big deal about how he'd sponsored the the Pandora bill, uh, and and I think there there is still particularly in the Republican Party this desire to kind of stop just be being seen as, as like a party of sort of old line CEOs yeah. and to continue you know, to, to try to try and walk the walk the walk a little bit with their talk about innovation and stuff and, and cozy up to some actually more innovative enterprises. Um, but but that said, all of these streaming services have got to figure out a way to make these deals much more palatable to artists. Because yeah. right right now they're getting pressed from both directions. You know they're they're not actually making any money right now. The the, the actual statutory royalty rates are too high. Uh, you, you can't run these services for a profit. Um, and if you can't run these services for a profit, then you know artists are never going to get anything ever. Uh, but they've got to find a way to make things not look like a complete rip off yeah. for for artists. So that people so that I mean, when high profile people like Tom York are leaving. Are leaving Spotify, that looks really bad for all the streaming companies, not just for Spotify. Yep. Uh, and, and in part, this is this is you know the label's responsibility. But I think you know the labels are equity holders in, in Spotify. I mean, they've got to figure out a way a way to make this you know more make this at least look better uh, if they want to see something move politically. Yeah, and, and Zach, and, and uh, uh, from your view, uh, uh, you know, at Forbes, uh, how, how do you see Pandora uh, shaping up for the next few months? Uh, of course, uh, you know, I think uh, Greg is very right in saying that Pandora needs to relook at its PR strategy and uh, and find a way to communicate better what it's trying to do and not fumble its messaging quite so much. Uh, and also, you know, maybe it's just is just blown out of proportion and Pandora also made the wrong move in, in trying to request such a high cut uh, in the royalty rates uh, while really if they, if they had managed to pass a 15 or 20% cut which would be more reasonable uh, then uh, the company would actually become a profitable one and so that's you know a step forward certainly for them. So what are your thoughts on Pandora and on what's going to happen in the next couple of months? Um, you know yeah I think you know I think it really it comes down to, you know, in terms of the PR issue, um, you know, it's, it's still an issue of scale with all these streaming services. We're still in the, in the single digits of market share. Uh, terrestrial radio is still, you know, the, the big giant in the room. And I, I honestly think that a lot of these complaints uh, from artists are going to go away, um, you know, when, when those uh, market share numbers start to, to go up. I mean, you know, who knows how long that'll take, but, you know, if, if, uh, I mean, I forget the exact numbers, but was it in, in this low single-digit percentages for Spotify and for Pandora of the, of the total uh, um, overall, you know, uh, music listening? Uh, is it something very low? And it, you know, it's very low. Yes. That, <laughs> yeah. If you multiply that by ten, you know, and then you multiply those checks by ten, you know, then I, I think that some of these artists are going to stop um, complaining so much. But yeah, yeah, you know, I think the other big thing that 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 nobody really talks about. Is that Pandora and Spotify, um, you know, all these streaming services actually pay, um, you know, recording artists as, as well as songwriters, um, yeah. unlike terrestrial radio. And people, uh, you know, people, I think, outside of the music industry don't realize that. And, I, you know, I think the, that fact, um, I mean, 
you know, the, the argument for terrestrial radio was, oh, well, we, we won't pay recording artists, we only pay publishers, um, you know, because it's, it's just good uh, publicity for them, it's good promotion, you know, w which is the same argument that the streaming services are making now, but they're actually paying recording artists. Not paying <laughs> yeah, right. Right. Um, but, yeah. you know, they're, they're paying. And, you know, to be fair, um, you know, probably a lot of the, the artists who are big enough to um, be getting, uh, you know, mainstream radio play, um, somebody like Rihanna, who's maybe uh, not really writing her own songs at all, um, you know, she maybe has gotten cut in on the publishing somehow, or at yeah. the very least she can really make it up on the, on the touring side. Um, but, you know, I think that the, the framework exists, again, if, you know, if, if the music industry can get this right um, for streaming to more fairly compensate um, artists because it, it compensates recording artists as well as um, songwriters. And, uh, you know, I think that will that ever change with terrestrial radio? Um, you know, highly unlikely because it's so entrenched and there, there's, you know, a hundred years of history and, you know, there are companies, lobby groups that have existed for, you know, for, for decades and decades um, who are entrenched and, you know, kind of have a lot invested in not making this happen. But, Absolutely. you know, you, you hear people like Irving Azoff talking about this a lot. You know, why, why doesn't terrestrial radio um, pay uh, recording artists well as songwriters? Um, and again, I just think that, you know, as time goes on and, and these services start to scale more, um, some of these questions will go away when, when our artists start getting, you know, getting checks that are much bigger. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and, and Zachary, I, I was um, actually, I forgot to ask you earlier, one of the key issues that uh, people are talking about um, on the other side of the spectrum, which is uh, not uh, on the side of, of Pandora and the Internet Radio Fairness Act, but on the side of trying to get terrestrial radios uh, to uh, square up and start paying, uh, which they haven't mm -hmm. done so far. Uh, Again, you know, a huge amount of uh, corporate push from both sides. Uh, here we're talking about uh, uh, the giants of radio, which are probably much bigger and more and better funded than the giants of the music industry. Of course, the music industry has got artists supporting it, which can be quite vocal about uh, certain types of things. Uh, but uh, I've heard like both at South by Southwest uh, and in DC uh, last month, uh, so much talk about people trying to push for terrestrial radio to start paying. Do you think that's... Uh, a feasible outlook, and uh, you know how would that materialize? I think it's extremely unlikely that you will see any type of you know mechanical royalty, or whatever. I guess it wouldn't be mechanical if it's on terrestrial radio, but yeah. you would see any any type of performance royalty uh, come, coming out of Congress uh, ever. Not not just now, not just this month, ever. I, I think the industry <laughs> has existed under the structure for a very long time. Yeah. Um, the lobby groups that are that are at play here. I mean, I actually think that the record labels are much more influential inside the Beltway than the radio stations. They're not, you know, they, they want that More money. glamorous. <laughs> uh, they, they, would, they would love to get that money, and they haven't been able to get it for decades. I, I just really think it's, it's unlikely that that's going to happen. Um, and, and, and you'll, be, you, you'll get this, this pushback from terrestrial radio and from opponents of, of the bill saying, you know, look, why even bother with this? Radio works. Artists get paid from, from radio indirectly when they're songwriters. And in fact, I, I think Zach's totally right there when he says, you know, the reason artists haven't really complained and made that big a fuss over terrestrial radio is because a lot of them are songwriters. And, and for a lot of them, you know, the way they've, they've actually made their money is not through record sales, uh, but, through, but through songwriting royalties. Uh, and, and so people like radio because it's actually made them, made them some money. Um, I, I think in general, all of these debates, in order to get any kind of real grassroots support from musicians, they've got to find a way to bring smaller artists into, to, to the table and make them feel like they have a stake in things. And right now, you know, terrestrial, terrestrial radio, you know, if, even though it's such a big part of the market, there are only a handful of artists at any given time who are making a significant amount of money off of terrestrial radio or who stand to make a significant amount of money. And if you want to bring in musicians generally, you've got to be able to say, well, look, you know, you can make three or $4,000 a year off of this. You could make thirty or $40,000 a year off of this. You know, some, something that's not crazy big time money, but, but money that artists, you know, musicians who, who are really struggling to make it, they don't make a whole lot of money. It doesn't yeah. actually take that much to appease them. Uh, but you you know you've seen record labels and and most of the industry infrastructure for decades be really not very open minded to that sort of change, uh, and I think you know particularly if we if we moved from you know, to to a serious talk about you know overhauling the copyright laws or even to something you know more finer tuned about the Pandora bill, you know if if the record labels could figure out a way you know to to just throw little artists a tiny bone, I think you'd see a lot of the resistance go away politically. I think you you I think you would have a chance to to move something. But right now. Yeah. 
uh, you know, with, with the debt ceiling coming up and all sorts of other stuff, there's just no way we're going to see a change in, in terrestrial radio royalty uh, in infrastructure. Yeah, exactly. There's only so much that Congress can get through uh, in one setting. And then, and then I guess, you know, if we, if we skip the next uh, eight to 10 months, then it's going to be election, election time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I think, you know, the, the radio stations don't have a good argument on, on, the, yeah. terrestrial, on, on the, the performance royalties. I mean, yeah. they, they would lose, I think, on the merits. Uh, you know, I mean, I think they've been losing on the merits for, for like 60 years, but they still don't have to pay the performance royalties. Yeah, so, <laughs> uh, you know, I, I just would be shocked if that changed. Great. And I also wanted to mention um, for people to go and check out uh, uh, a study that was released by Spotify uh, this uh, actually just at the end of last week uh, uh, that is penned by Will Page, who is their director of economics. Uh, and you can find that on press.spotify.com slash US or some, somewhere around there you will find that link. And essentially, it seeks uh, to uh, look at uh, what's happened in the Netherlands in the last uh, couple of years uh, since uh, Spotify has uh, uh, taken foothold in in the country uh, of course it doesn't it doesn't quite go so far as uh, to pen a direct correlation between uh, the arrival of Spotify and the uh, figures on, 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 on piracy for example but uh, uh, through the analysis of, of the P2P technology um, um, uh, downloads uh, which was done by the company Music Metrics it, it manages to pinpoint very accurately the data on piracy uh, versus the data on Spotify stream versus the data on related sales. And that's a good place to start when looking at, for example, the effects of uh, holdouts. So when artists decide not to put their albums on Spotify, so what happens then? Uh, does the release get um, more, uh, the par pirated more? Does that does it drive more sales? So what happens there? And, and there's a whole study around that, which is, I think, really interesting and quite in-depth. I think it's a 25-page report. So I would encourage your listeners to go and download that. Uh, but uh, I wouldn't delve too much into it. Uh, right now because it's quite it's quite detailed and the last story i wanted to talk about today well it came up yesterday actually it was broken by the hollywood reporter and it's uh, it's uh, all about a the songwriter amy mann uh, that we wouldn't we wouldn't normally talk about her on the show uh, i guess she has actually filed a lawsuit uh, against the digital music service medianet uh, and that was revealed yesterday for infringing her copyright on a number of works so the hollywood reporter p a report piece uh, by eric gardner uh, outlines pretty well amy mann's case so essentially uh, she uh, claims that Medianet uh, has been distributing uh, 120 of her tracks without having a proper license. Uh, she says that her license uh, uh, expired uh, uh, seven years ago, essentially. Uh, she sent uh, a letter to uh, uh, to stop the auto-renewal clause in her contract. She hasn't received any royalties from that. And, uh, uh, you know, that, that makes a very, very bad case for Medianet, if that's true. Of course, uh, the CEO of Medianet asked for a comment yesterday, and he said uh, in, in the comment, was that uh, they they uh, deny these charges and that uh, they think the matter will be resolved so this is an interesting case just because not, not just individually as a case but because it pinpoints the fact that artists uh, as they understand how important digital is becoming for their for the revenues are going to be more careful to really go deep into who has the music and how it's being used because of course we're dealing with uh, uh, catalogs of millions of tracks especially if you ended up licensing your music to a label at some point and maybe that was never taken off their catalog and it's licensed to another service and it ends up trickling down there and so where does your money go so uh, do you feel like there's going to be uh, a bit of a movement in the next uh, uh, few years where we're going to see more artists paying attention to where their music ends up and really uh, tracing down the revenue stream and trying to understand whether they're actually getting any money from the services that it's on because that's you know with hundreds of services uh, around the world on digital music it's actually not easy to keep track of all that uh, uh zacko what's your opinion yeah i mean you know i think certainly examples like this uh will you know will, will spur artists to be more vigilant um you know but it's it's interesting of course you know in, in the current era with things moving more and more toward digital um you know you would think that i don't know uh better records would be kept and there would be a clearer chain of you would think so. uh, you know, where everything goes. But of course, it's just like the old days, uh, you know, where, where did all those records go? Um, and, you know, the, 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 it, it seems to be just as difficult, uh, you know, to kind of keep track. So, I mean, I think as always, um, you know, it's, it's crucial for artists to have a vigilant team, um, you know, to, to, uh, to, to make sure that they stay in touch with their attorneys and agents and, and business managers, um, you know, and, and that, and that those, uh, kind of, uh, you know, intermediaries really kind of stay on top of, of these services to make sure that, uh, that the, art, the artists get paid, you know, or, or for, for enterprising artists, um, you know, 
to, to be, stay on the case yourself. I mean, I think, um, you know, more, more and more from, you know, from the Pomplamooses all the way up to the Jay-Z's, uh, you know, it's, it's the artist doing everything, um, you know, on his or her own uh, for, from the music um, to the to the uh, songwriting to the, the physical recording to you know to to the harassing of, of business people to <laughs> get their money, you know um, and, you know I, I think that um, you know although there are new examples it's in some ways a similar story um, you know you just have to stay on top of uh, the people who owe you money <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know? absolutely absolutely yeah. and, and I think I think uh, uh, Zachary that brings us back to uh, a point uh, that's kind of like uh, slightly unrelated but in a way because some of these companies have millions of tracks in their catalogs sometimes they can even keep track of contracts what's happening uh, do we still own the rights to these tracks have the licensing rights expired what's going on and it's actually pretty hard to keep uh, track of that especially if the artists in question uh, are not large enough to have those teams that are supporting them and helping them understand what's happening on the legal front so uh, on, on that front, I kind of wanted to relate it to the issue of uh, Orphan Works because that's a, that's a really big issue that is going to be part of the of the copyright review that's going to happen in, in, in the US as well. And uh, when I spoke to Mar Mar Maria Palante and, uh, and a couple of other uh, people that are involved uh, uh, last month, you know, Orphan Works seems like an issue that could perhaps uh, be one of the first on the, of the, on the agenda just because it's uh, relatively separated and and uh, uh, may not generate quite as much heat as uh, some of the other issues that may be addressed uh, during that review. So uh, d do you feel like uh, there's, a, there's a big need f to streamline the way in which uh, uh, rights are tracked and orphan works uh, are uh, are also uh, made available to the public or made available for use and is there uh, consequently a sort of a need to create a database like it's been touted for example where uh, the, those rights are being tracked and where people can actually go and find out who owns what and whether that, that track is available or not is is any of this feasible or is it just too big of an undertaking for uh, a government level agency to, to take on well, you know, we, we do have a government that, that, that provides copyrights, that, you know, is in the business of, of issuing intellectual property protections for things. Yeah. And I don't think it's really too much to ask that that, that be accompanied by a database <laughs> uh, and that that database be kept up to date and that the, the government yeah. have to have some, you know, accountable review process for maintaining that database. And, and I think taking that out of, you know, making that responsibility something that is public rather than the responsibility of, of every new service that's trying that's trying to innovate in this area is probably a really good idea. One way to lower some of some of the costs of uh, some of the barriers to entry for for, for these these new types of businesses. Uh, I think it's a very good idea. And Orphan Works in particular. I mean, we're actually talking here. When we, you know, Orphan Work is basically a work that, that no one is interested in anymore. No one's making any money off of it. They, there there isn't any actual uh, you know any any supply side from from this uh, from this piece of, uh, of of art, whatever it is. Um, and so you you would think institutionally that there would be at least less resistance to changing the copyright laws in that or you know the standards in 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 that regard because nobody cares about these things anyway. Yeah. I think in practice, if you're actually talking about overhauling the copyright system, you're going to see a lot of resistance from record labels and publishers and pharmaceutical companies immediately because they really like the existing system, even as bad as the music market has been for the last decade. They yeah. really really want to make sure that you know they have the strongest and longest <laughs> copyright you know protections possible. Yeah. Uh, and, and any, any, and it's weird how these things in Washington can be sort of like emotional and not, not rational. I mean, n none of these labels have any actual financial interest in orphan works. That's why they're orphan works. Yeah. But th the idea of opening the door a little bit, well, what if something else happened later on, uh, sort of goes into the, the minds of these, these companies and these lobbyists sure. and they, they push yeah. back. Um, but, but I think, you know, maintaining a database like that, I mean, that's, that you're not talking about any new government regulation there. You're not talking about even changing the rules. You're just talking about making things work better and a little more efficiently. And, and, and that's something in the digital age that ought to be, I think, a, a no-brainer. This is something the government can maintain for a very low cost. And that would, that would provide some transparency. You know, when, when Amy Mann brings this type of lawsuit, you know, when she complains and her stuff gets lost in the shuffle, let's, you know, let's make the most charitable case for, you know, for, for the company here. Um, let's just say they've been trying to play fair the, the whole time and, uh, and, and, you know, have, have just lost things in the shuffle. You know, it would be really easy to check and see what happened there. You know, you just go to the database. Oh, yep. I mean, man stuff, we don't have those rights or we do have those rights. And you could resolve this without, without a, a, you know, a drawn out legal battle. Yeah which ultimately would be good for, for artists like Amy Mann, who is, you know, I, I think she's still in the category of people who are making enough money for music that it's, it's kind of a luxury to be able to challenge these things. Yeah. Uh, but, it's expensive. Uh, but, yeah, it, it is. And, and there's, there's actually enough money in it for her that it's, it's worth making a fuss over. I mean, a lot of artists, 
you know, okay, well, if, you know, if you're, you're getting screwed over by Spotify or something uh, and they actually owe you like 40 bucks, then why, why bother? <laughs> you know, it's not worth it. <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 a, it's absolutely a fair point. And of course, you know, I wasn't trying to imply that tracks that are where the licensing has lapsed should go in, into Orphan Works. I, I was just making the point that there's lack of a database. And so we can't right. really keep track of any of that data. And so then how can you make any argument pro or against it? It becomes really difficult. I mean, I, I dealt with uh, licensing older tracks, you know, we're talking about 30, 40 years old, yeah. where you have to go through the paperwork and you have to really go through the contracts and, and they have to dig them up. And, 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 it's, and it's difficult because uh, uh, <laughs> there's a, it's still a paper a paper world, which is uh, absolutely insane, but that's, that's how it is. You can't keep track of millions of tracks uh, electronically, apparently. So. Yeah. yeah. Well, they make, I mean, that gives these services an, an incentive to just do business with, with the bigger companies, too, and yeah. the bigger labels, because, well, well, I know what our deal is with EMI. I know what our deal is with Universal. Like, you don't, you don't have to wonder, like, okay, which, which little artist are you? I mean, it, 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 it ends up saving the services time, and that ends up being bad for smaller artists. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and Zach, just to finish with you, uh, I wanted to ask you, uh, how, how, how is your, have you spoken to any technology companies about problems of, for example, acquiring rights or acquiring information about rights? And do you feel like uh, this process has got any easier? I mean, I know that uh, the, um, Harry Fox and, and also Medianet, to an extent, have tried to stop providing it. Uh, you know, Harry Fox, uh, of course, m much more so than Medianet, but they're, they're providing information on uh, rights holders and publishing information and all that. But uh, smaller companies, are they having difficulty? I mean, I, I know from, from London that, that they are for sure here. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, I, I think, again, with small companies, it's it's very anecdotal. It goes on a case-by-case -case basis. But, um, you know, regardless of, of the, the reforms and the efforts and, and so forth, um, you know, it's it's kind of a big, scary world, and it's kind of hard to, you know, to, to wrap your mind around it um, if, you're, if you're a small company. Company, uh, and, you know, and to, and to kind of get the time of day from from some of these companies. So, uh, you know, I think again, it's total case by case basis, and it would really depend um, on the company. That you know, um, certainly uh, steps in the right direction. I think is is what's going on now, and, and yeah. hopefully for everyone uh, they continue. Yeah, yeah, hopefully that, that's uh, that's really the hope. Uh, well, uh, guys, it was uh, absolutely a pleasure having you on the show. I just wanted to go uh, run, run by you and ask if there's anything in particular that you want to uh, uh, plug or uh, otherwise just uh, plug your, your company's website, your own website or your Twitter handle, whatever you like. And so, uh, Zachary, do you, you want to go first? <laughs> sure. I, uh, I write for the Huffington Post. Uh, you can see me on uh, HuffPost Live every now and then. And my band, Drunk Tigers, has our EP coming out on uh, Funny Not Funny Records in September. Awesome. Awesome news. I'll, I'll check that out. Is, is it going to be on Spotify? Uh, yeah, I think it is. We, we have a, a little deal where we'll, we'll collect uh, you know, dozens of pennies from Spotify and Pandora. Great. <laughs> so, <you> know, <laughs> You'll get a whole uh, maybe like 20, 20 pennies from me. Yeah, if I listen uh, to it we'll, twice. Yeah, you know. Yeah, we're going to make millions. We're going to be huge. Why, why am I downplaying it? Of That's great. Uh, and, and Zach, from your end, uh, uh, how do people find out about your work at Forbes? Uh, yeah, you can go to Forbes.com uh, or you can find me on Twitter. My handle is ZogBlog, Z-O-G-B-L-O-G, and I, I tweet out um, all of the links to the articles that I write. That's great. Awesome handle. Uh, well, thanks very much, guys, uh, for uh, staying with me for this hour. And thanks so much for listening. Digital Music Trends is available on a variety of platforms as audio and video. You can subscribe to the YouTube, chan YouTube channel on uh, youtube.com slash digital music trends and uh, on SoundCloud on soundcloud.com slash digital music trends. Have a great week and until next time. And that's all for this week. I really hope you enjoyed the show. Check out digitalmusictrends.com and sign up to the weekly newsletter.